Hello everyone, welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. So far in this course, your computer projects have been modeling fuel and moderator using some incredibly detailed models. The spatial resolution that we have used in our codes is around 0.01 centimeters, which is an incredibly fine degree of resolution. Unfortunately, real reactor modelers can't use such finely resolved models. A typical light water reactor might contain more than 50,000 fuel elements, and modeling each element individually is usually not possible. Doing so will either explode the memory footprint for the simulation, or it will force the runtime to be so long that it's not feasible to perform the thousands of simulations necessary to design a reactor. So instead, reactor physicists have developed methods to homogenize, or smear together, parts of a reactor. Instead of solving for the neutron flux at many spatial locations throughout a fuel pin, reactor physicists will solve for just one flux in the fuel pin, often using only two energy groups. Homogenizing the fuel is difficult because of how much the flux varies throughout the fuel pins and throughout the moderator regions, as you have no doubt seen in your computer projects. An accurate multi-group homogenization scheme will develop an average flux that accounts for all the spatial and energy variations in the neutron flux throughout a region. So how do we do this? How do we homogenize? Well, just like before, we begin by defining an average cross-section, and then by using that average cross-section and a series of diffusion or Boltzmann transport calculations to solve for the flux in our homogenized cells. The key here is to define our average cross-section such that it preserves the true, unhomogenized, or heterogeneous, reaction rates in our cell. In this process, we can also define some average fluxes to use in our average cross-section equation. The first one is the average flux in the moderator, phi sub m, and the second is the average flux in the fuel, phi sub f. We'll define another term, which is known as the cell disadvantage factor. The cell disadvantage factor is simply the ratio of the average flux in the moderator to the average flux in the fuel. In general, this cell disadvantage factor and these average fluxes refer to the thermal fluxes in the fuel. So what values can we generally expect for this disadvantage factor? Well, for fast neutrons, the disadvantage factor is generally about 1. The mean free path for fast neutrons is generally much, much larger than the dimensions of a fuel pin or a moderator region. So the fast flux doesn't really change that much between the fuel and moderator regions in one fuel element. However, for thermal neutrons, the disadvantage factor is generally greater, and sometimes much greater, than 1. Again, this is due to spatial self-shielding in the fuel. Thermal neutrons are born by slowing down fast neutrons in the moderator region and they leak back into the fuel where they are then absorbed. However, the high cross-section of absorption for thermal neutrons in the fuel results in a significant depression in the thermal flux near the center of the fuel pin. This flux depression causes the average flux in the fuel pin to be much smaller than the average flux in the moderator, and hence causes the disadvantage factor to be greater than 1. So how does knowing the flux disadvantage factor help us? Well, let's go back to our average cross-section equations. If we substitute in the average fluxes and average cross-sections for the fuel and moderator regions, as well as the volume of the fuel and moderator regions, V sub m and V sub f, then we can obtain this expression. Dividing both sides by V sub f times the fuel average flux yields this expression, which now contains the cell disadvantage factor. So in summary, if we know the disadvantage factor, then we know how to combine the fuel and moderator cross-sections to obtain a representative average cross-section for the homogenized cell. We can obtain estimates for the fuel and moderator cross-sections using infinite medium calculations, and we can very easily obtain the volumes for the fuel and moderator regions. So if we can compute our cell disadvantage factor, then we can obtain some very good estimates for the homogenized cell's effective cross-section. So how can we calculate the cell disadvantage factor? Several methods exist for doing this, and we'll briefly discuss one that uses the four factors. Let's start this by discussing how homogenization affects the four factors. We'll start with eta. Eta is again the average number of fission neutrons released per thermal neutron absorption in the fuel. Eta is really not affected that much by homogenization. Changing the energy spectrum of the neutron flux 
can affect ADA by altering the fuel's capture to fission ratio, but generally this impact is small compared to the other changes in the four factors. Additionally, ADA is generally computed for thermal neutron fluxes, which means that ADA can be insulated even more by spectral changes. In reality, ADA mostly just depends on what isotope is being used as the fuel in a reactor. The fast fission factor isn't really affected by homogenization either. Homogenization may have a small impact on the fast fission factor, but it's usually not very significant, especially if the homogenized cross-sections are defined such that they preserve the average thermal fission rate in the homogenized cell. On the other hand, the resonance escape probability is significantly affected by homogenization. To be more specific, homogenization will lower the resonance escape probability for a cell. Why is this? Well, imagine that you're a resonance energy neutron in a reactor, specifically in a fuel pin. Because you're at resonance energy, any kind of interaction with a fuel absorber isotope is the kiss of death. Resonance energy cross-sections are so high that it's essentially guaranteed that you will be absorbed by the fuel. If the fuel cell is homogenized, then fuel exists everywhere, which means that you will always be exposed to fuel isotopes. Thus, you will be absorbed quickly no matter what you do and no matter where you are born. In contrast, if the cell is heterogeneous, then you have a chance to escape the fuel and to collide with isotopes in the moderator region and lose enough energy so that you're no longer at resonance energies. Furthermore, resonance energy neutrons are generally born in the moderator by fast neutrons as they are thermalizing, which means that in a heterogeneous model, that these resonance energy neutrons will immediately have a chance to collide with more moderator before interacting with fuel. Thus, the resonance escape probability is higher in the heterogeneous systems and lower in the homogeneous systems. Lastly, what about the thermal utilization factor? The thermal utilization factor, F, is again the ratio of the number of thermal neutrons absorbed in the fuel to the number of thermal neutrons absorbed in the fuel and in the moderator, which we can express like this using our average fluxes and average cross-sections. If we divide both the numerator and denominator terms by the fuel volume and the fuel average flux, then we arrive at this equation, which now contains a cell disadvantage factor. Now, if our cell is homogenized, then the fuel and moderator fluxes are equal, which gives us this expression for the homogenized thermal utilization factor. Because our cell disadvantage factor is almost always greater than one, then this means that our naive homogenized thermal utilization factor is actually greater than our actual real heterogeneous thermal utilization factor. This gets us somewhere. If we look at the equation for our heterogeneous thermal utilization factor, then we can rearrange our terms to develop an expression for the cell disadvantage factor. But in a way, we've really just kicked the can down the road, because we now need to calculate the thermal utilization factor to be able to calculate our cell disadvantage factor to be able to compute our average cross-sections for the homogenized cell. So how do we do this? How do we get the thermal utilization factor? The exact methods for doing this are really beyond the scope of what we want to discuss in this course. But one method for doing so is known as the ABH method. This approach involves estimating the probability that a neutron born isotropically in the fuel will eventually be absorbed in the moderator, and also we need the probability that a neutron born isotropically in the moderator will be absorbed eventually in the fuel. Deuter, Stanton, Hamilton discuss the ABH method in detail, and you can take a look at their description if you're interested in learning more about this method. So now, we have an approach for computing the cell disadvantage factor for a homogenized fuel pin, which allows us to compute the effective homogenized cross-section for that fuel pin. To wrap up our brief discussion of homogenization, it's worth discussing several other common reactor physics concepts that are frequently applied to homogenization schemes. The first of these is known as the Dankoff factor, which can be used to improve the accuracy of the PMF and PFM probabilities from earlier. As mentioned earlier, PFM is the probability that a neutron emitted in the fuel will eventually be absorbed in the moderator. However, this probability generally only considers one fuel region and one moderator region. The Dankoff factor corrects this assumption and adjusts our PFMs 
to account for possible interaction between multiple fuel pins and also for the fact that these fuel pins might be arranged in irregular patterns. Dankoff factors are, for example, extremely necessary when homogenizing can-do reactor fuel, which is often arranged in this interesting horizontal ring pattern. The second correction term we'll discuss is the flux discontinuity factor. After we obtain our homogenized cross-sections for our different fuel regions, we'll generally want to place them together into a larger model. Maybe we're modeling fuel assemblies, and we want to put them all together to model fuel in multiple assemblies within a reactor. Our fuel assemblies might have different enrichments, and the flux between the fuel assemblies might look like this. You would have dips and peaks in the thermal flux as you move between the fuel pin and the moderator regions, and you could have one very big dip, for example, when you cross from one fuel assembly into another with a different fuel enrichment. If you model these assemblies using just the homogenized cross-sections, then you'll get a flux that is fairly incorrect near the boundary between the fuel assemblies. This is because our boundary condition from earlier assumes that the flux must be continuous between two different zones, and a very clever approach to improve our estimates of the flux and to account for this variance between fuel assemblies is to ignore our earlier boundary condition. Instead, we'll allow the flux to have a discontinuous jump between the two fuel assemblies. This might be less mathematically rigorous, but it actually results in a homogenized flux that is more representative of the true neutron flux than before. The factor that we use to modify our boundary fluxes is known as the discontinuity factor. Discontinuity factors have been incorporated into numerous radiation transport codes with great success. Discontinuity factors were originally developed by a fellow by the name of Cord Smith, who went on to implement them in a code called CASMO, which is now one of the leading reactor design and simulation tools in the world. And this completes our brief excursion into the world of fuel homogenization. Nuclear engineers have poured decades of research into reactor homogenization, and we've only spent one lecture discussing the basic introductory concepts of homogenization. However, if you'd like to learn more about homogenization, then I'd recommend pursuing a graduate course on the subject or spending an internship at a reactor vendor or design company.